thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about some new methods uh, uh, for Bayesian deep learning. It's actually the first part of uh, Jun's talk and that he didn't cover. It's Bayesian methods for deep learning. Um, this is uh, joint work with lots of amazing people. Um, okay, where is my cursor? Okay, you can see it. Yeah, so this is Woot, Didrik, and Wu from uh, from Riken, Yarin from Oxford, Juzu from Singapore, who was my intern, and Akash uh, from Edinburgh. So let me start by uh, just telling you, uh, you know, a comparison between deep learning versus based in deep learning. The last two speakers have talked about this. Uh, in standard deep learning, we are usually computing a point estimate using maximum likelihood estimation. So if you're giving a network, and let's say the network weights, they're denoted by theta, you define a log likelihood and you maximize it to compute one estimate of the parameter. Uh, now, Bayesian deep learning is trying to go beyond this and trying to find a distribution around my parameters. And this distribution is the posterior distribution usually found by using Bayesian uh, base rule. And so the advantage um, is, you know, the previous two speakers have already talked about this, is that you, you can have some estimate of uncertainty. So you know, uh, you know, you have an idea about how much you don't know about your network weight. And you can use this uh, uncertainty estimate to design methods that are uh, robust, that hopefully fail less often. So just to give you an example of this, this is an example taken from, uh, from this paper. Um, in the left-hand side, there's a scene. And it's probably what your self-driving car is seeing. And in the right-hand side, there is uh, an uncertainty estimate of depth uh, estimate, meaning that how far or close things are in that scene. And you can see that the, the system is sort of confused about some edges. Um, uh, this should be because maybe it doesn't know if this belongs to the tree or this belongs to the sky. And if you have some estimate of this type of uncertainty, maybe you're, you can make your self-driving car a little bit safer. So that's basically the kind of hope that we have with Bayesian methods. Uh, and it's all good in theory, but the problem, uh, one of the problem is that when you go and you know define a Bayesian model, then you have to compute this posterior distribution. Well, the normalizing constant is, uh, is uh, uh, usually intractable um, because you have to average over a large number of parameters, right? So if theta is 1 million, then this is a really, really big integral. So methods like MCMC, they have not uh, really been used that much. Uh, and people have been usually ret resorting to uh, variational inference. Um, as as uh, Jun was talking just now, is that variational inference can be cast as an optimization problem. So it's basically trying to approximate this integral. And then once uh, once you have an optimization problem, you can just apply a stochastic gradient method, right? So then you have the code that's written in standard deep learning software, and you just apply it to the variational inference objective. So there's a couple of work from from DeepMind, from David Blass Group, and many others that I've not listed here. Um, in this talk, I'm going to try to make a case for a natural gradient descent for variational inference, as opposed to sorry, uh, too soon. Um, natural gradient descent for a variational inference opposed to doing uh, standard gradient methods. Right? So we know that natural gradient descent uh, is expected to be uh, faster to converge, uh, but my hope is to convince you that it's also easier to implement when it's applied to variational inference. Right? So that's, that's the sort of the talk that I, uh, the summary of the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about a natural gradient descent, actually an approximate way to do natural gradient descent, uh, to obtain Gaussian approximation for variational inference. And what you will see in the end is that you just take standard deep learning optimizers and you sort of do small modification. And the modification is basically you take the network weights, you add some noise to it uh, when you're doing back propagation, and that allows you to perform natural gradient variational inference approximately. Okay, so, so before I get into this, uh, let me tell you a little bit of a background on what Gaussian variational inference is. Um, so throughout the talk, I'm going to assume a very, very simple setting that the prior is a Gaussian, it's a zero mean, and lambda is a precision parameter that's known beforehand. So in variational inference, what we do is that we approximate the posterior distribution by a fixed form distribution. So in this talk, I'm going to choose it to be Gaussian. Uh, the mean uh, mu uh, is unknown, and the covariance matrix is assumed to be a diagonal, and its diagonal is a vector and I don't know that vector as well. So my goal is to find mu and sigma square such that the, the 
and the Q of theta is close to my exact posterior distribution. So it's a Gaussian approximation. So it's a very simple setting. Um, and in variational inference, you, you, know, you, you try to minimize the KL divergence. And it's very nice. You can just write it as an optimization problem. And the optimization problem, sorry, it's a little bit below, uh, looks pretty much like what you have in machine learning. So you have you know, a data fit term. So this is like a log likelihood term in trying to maximize this. You're trying to actually maximize its expectation under the distribution that you're trying to find. And then you want that distribution, this Q of theta, this posterior approximation, to be close to your prior distribution. So there is a regularization term. So you sort of do a trade-off. You can write the objective um, you know, with respect to mu and sigma square, and then you maximize this. And this gives you an approximation to the integral as a lower bound, and you know, all of this is other detail. Um, I don't want to go into too much math, because variational inference uh, may be too much math now. <laughs> so, so it's basically an optimization problem, and you can just throw SGD at it, and that's all good. So that's what people have been doing. Uh, but the problem is that when you really directly apply SGD to optimize the parameters of a distribution, uh, you know, this is not the most optimal thing and the implementation sort of is not very nice. So that's, uh, let, let, let me show you this a little bit. Before, uh, uh, so my goal is to show that implementation of MLE and variational inference is quite different. Uh, first, let me describe MLE, so which is maximum likelihood estimation. I'm going to den denote log likelihood by F. So um, there's a method called RMSPROP. I've just chosen that for convenience. Well, it's a stochastic gradient method. So you first compute the stochastic gradient. And then you do like an update, like a stochastic gradient update. So the mu is your iterate. And you update it by taking a step into the direction of the gradient. Right? So one uh, important thing here is that you are scaling the gradient. So it's an adaptive learning rate method. It's an adaptive gradient method. And you find this uh, scale vector by just um, you know, computing uh, an estimate of the gradient magnitude. So this is square of the gradient. And you maintain an online estimate, uh, and you basically just uh, adapt your step size according to it. So this is very, very simple. And this is available in most of the deep learning software. Um, and it's just a plug and play thing. So when you go, you, know, you try to uh, apply this algorithm for variational inference, what you would do, you want to optimize mu and sigma square, and you will just, instead of f, you will replace this f by l, and then you, know, you will run the same code. Uh, but the problem is that if you do that, then it's kind of not very elegant. Um, I, I know that I'm being really picky here, but uh, still, when you go to implement this thing, uh, you have uh, mean and the variance. Now you have two parameters to, uh, to optimize, while you had only one here. You have to take the gradient of the lower bound. Uh, this is still OK. Turns out when you want to take the gradient with respect to the variance parameter, you have to compute the Hessian, the second derivative, and it's not usually available in the deep learning software. So there are these kind of, you know, the code doesn't look very much like the MLE code. It's just different. Uh, a more theoretical problem that, um, that comes out is, um, is that you have these scaling vectors for mu and sigma. Um, and you have to sort of compute this just like you do in RMS props. You have to do some gradient magnitude, and you have to uh, compute these scaling vectors. What I'm going to show you is that if you do natural gradient descent, these scaling uh, vectors are automatically computed. And it turns out that the code looks almost identical to this. Right, so that's, that's what I, I want to show you. Um, this is the method black box variational inference, by the way. It's uh, proposed by David Bly's group. So, okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so this first method in that sequence of methods that I'm going to present, it's a perturbed RMS prop method. And it's trying to do natural gradient variational inference. So a natural gradient descent for the variational objective. Um, uh, and we call it VPROP um, because of similarity. So what happens here is that the first three lines of the code are almost identical. It's just that I have added a perturbation. So I've sampled this epsilon from a uh, standard normal distribution, and I've scaled it with the scaling matrix that I had. And I've added this precision parameter here. This is the prior precision for the prior Ga Gaussian prior distribution that I had. So it's almost identical. And once I do this, I just take a step to update only the mean parameter. Yes? So how is this natural? Yeah, it will come afterwards. So I'm sorry. I've, I, I didn't mean to m build suspense, but you know. I found that this was the easiest way to get to it, although the work was done in the opposite way. 
okay, so 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 let, let me just finish this the next slide. Um, so all the you know so I basically just update only the mean parameter, and I add some contribution from the prior, some small differences here, this lambda, this delta, you know, they are set like that. But what happens overall is that this uh, goes to approximately to the solution of the variational objective. So it doesn't solve it exactly. There, there is an approximation here in the gradient magnitude, but it's, uh, it's doing the job, you'll see. So, okay. so this is what I'm going to try to convince you that this is natural gradient for uh, descent for variational inference. That's my goal. Okay. So it's an approximate natural gradient variational inference by using perturbed RMS prop. First, I'm going to talk about RMS prop. Then I'm going to show the variant to Adam. So now it will look like that this is a different talk completely because this is a different paper. Uh, so now I'm going to, you know, first going to introduce natural gradient variational inference. What do I mean by na doing natural gradient descent for the variational objective? Uh, let's just say the lambda is the parameter of the distribution. So I've chosen for convenience, I've just chosen this lambda to be natural parameter. Okay. So gradient descent, you just take the gradient of the variational objective, you take a step, right? Uh, in natural gradient descent, you scale this gradient by the Fisher information matrix. So in this case, this Fisher information matrix is the Fisher information matrix of uh, the Gaussian distribution that you're trying to approximate. It's the Q of theta. Okay? Um, and this has nice property that you know, you're sort of adapting the step size as well here. Uh, uh, but the problem is that usually this uh, um, update is difficult to implement. Uh, you don't have a closed form solution usually. So in, uh, you know, we use uh, the result from this paper. This is a very, very nice result. Um, uh, and what it says that I can perform natural gradient descent by using a mirror descent uh, problem. So this gets a little bit complicated here. But, uh, but you know, yeah, I'll slowly walk you through it. Uh, well, what you do is instead of natural parameter, you go to expectation parameters. So for a Gaussian expectation parameter is just first and second moment, okay? So you go to a different space, um, and then you write the mirror descent problem in this space, um, and it's just like standard gradient descent. You have a first order approximation here, and then you change the geometry from Euclidean to uh, uh, a Bregman divergence. So in this case, we have chosen it to be a Kale divergence. Right. So this is the mirror descent. And what this paper shows, this Raskuti and Mukherjee paper, that this uh, mirror descent is exactly equal to this natural gra gradient descent. So each step of the mirror descent is equal to natural gradient descent. Um, and then uh, following that work, in our paper we showed that the update of mirror descent is usually easier, easier to write for exponential family. Okay, so that's the sort of main result that we, that we use here. Um, and, you know, I don't have much time to show why this results in uh, easier uh, uh, update, but I'll just uh, show you what the update looks like. Uh, so the update looks like uh, something like this. So if you take this mirror descent and you, uh, sorry, you just basically, you know, do some mathematical manipulations, you get an update for Gaussian that looks like this. And this works for general exponential family, by the way. Um, so you have the, the main uh, thing here is that you're updating the, the mean parameter and the scale of the mean parameter, the gradient, you see the gradient here, uh, and it's scaled by the variance parameter. Right? So it's like a Newton method where the covariance is sort of scaling the gradient of, uh, with respect to the mean parameter. So that's, that's basically how the, ad the uh, adapting the step size of this mean update is happening. Uh, the second thing that is different here is that you're updating the precision parameter. Uh, you're not updating the variance parameter. So you can compare this to the method that I showed before, black box variational inference, uh, where you were updating mean, and then you, have, you could choose sigma, you could choose log of sigma, you could choose some other parameterization. But then you'll have to find these scale vectors. You have to find them you know, uh, in some, um, some um, hacky way. Here, uh, the natural gradient is saying that my, uh, my scaling should be sigma square, the scaling here is just one, okay? So that actually is the main, uh, you know, foundation for why this looks like our misprop is because you're adapting the step size of the mean parameter uh, with this variance parameter, so it's very natural. Uh, so from here to get to our misprop, we do one more step. Well, as I said before, is that this 
gradient with respect to the variance, it's, uh, you know, it's, you have to compute a second order derivative, which is not usually available in the deep learning software. So we make an approximation, uh, and this is not a good approximation. So we take the Hessian and we approximate it by gradient magnitude. And this approximation was also used by uh, Graves in his, uh, Alex Graves in his paper. Um, so this is, you know, square of the gradient is approximating the Hessian. So you, if you plug this thing here, here, you call this the scale vector, you do some manipulation, then you sort of get RMS prop from it. So it's just some math afterwards. Okay. I've lost almost all of you, I guess. But <laughs> okay. So, so I told you that this is RMS prop, but let me just try to show you uh, how bad it is uh, in computing the uncertainty estimate. So we made an approximation. Uh, so it's sor you sort of lose a little bit. Um, so this is an example from, from Kevin's book. Uh, it's a 2D logistic regression. You have two dimensions here. And uh, this is the mode, uh, the map estimate. And uh, this is sort of the contour sort of show you the posterior. So posterior is sort of, sh uh, you know, it, it's, um, sorry, it's, uh, it's skewed towards this direction. And the most of the mass is somewhere here. So if you use uh, exact Hessian and do variational inference, your, your Gaussian approximation will look like this. I'm showing one standard deviation here. Uh, and if you do the, the gradient magnitude approximation, it shrinks the, uh, the uncertainty estimate. So it, it loses some quality in your uncertainty estimate. But as, uh, as, as I'll show you in our experiments, uh, this is much faster to run than that. So in finite time, this usually wins. So if you run this algorithm really long enough and you run your MCMC chain even longer, uh, you know you know which algorithm's gonna run, right, uh, win. Uh, but in finite time, this works quite well. And I'll show you the result very soon, okay? So this is sort of the summary. This algorithm, I have just perturbed the weights uh, and just you know, added the contribution from the prior. Uh, and this is uh, reaching to, uh, you know, it's doing natural gradient variational inference and it's reaching uh, to, uh, to a local minimum of the variational objective approximately because you have made the approximation. This should be Hessian. If this is Hessian, then everything is exact. If this is G squared, then, then you make an approximation. Okay. Okay. So, any questions? Yes. So how uncertain is your uncertainty? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uncertain about that answer. <laughs> Sorry? You have the result. That doesn't look good approximation to me. Yes. And I'm being very honest about it. It's, a, it's really about implementation. You can run. So I'll show you the next slide where you see the result of why you should not use Hessian. Right? Because it converges really, really slow. So you will see. Okay. So. Uh, so usually Atom works much better in practice. So can we derive Atom by using the same thing? Well, uh, what we do is we take this mirror descent update that I showed you before. This is just natural gradient descent. And we add a momentum term. So it's like just like standard momentum term, but now it's defined uh, using KL divergence. Right? So it's just the distance has changed. And if you do the same math, like write the closed form solution for the mirror descent, make an approximation for the Hessian, do some mathematical manipulation, then you get an algorithm which is just like Adam, but then you just perturb the weights. Okay? So that works out. And this really works very well in practice. And this is, I hope this is the answer to Masashi's question. Uh, so uh, here's an example. This is Bayesian regression with DNN on a small, uh, small example. And uh, y-axis is RMSE, lower is better, x-axis is just iteration. So black box variational inference, the method that I showed you, this is using 200 Monte Carlo sample and converges really, really slowly. So this is using the exact Hessian. Right? Uh, while if you use VPROP just with one sample, it's already converging much faster. And if you use 10 samples, it improves a little bit. But if you add momentum to it, you go to Adam way, then it's really, really converging very fast. What does the 50 mean? 50 DNN 50. I think it's one hidden layer with 50 units. I know it's pretty depressing. But this is benchmark in Bayesian literature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I know. I'll show you more bigger results uh, soon. So don't worry. Okay, so this is like lots of other, you know, data sets, like six to eight data sets we tried. And Magenta is the other people's work and Red is our work and it's always sort of converging much faster, as you can see. Right. 
I hope this convinces you. So if you let this run really, really long, I think the magenta will catch up, right? But uh, I, I want to finish it uh, before my kids grow. So, <laughs> okay, so, so far I've been talking about variational inference. L let me switch gear and, sh uh, uh, how many minutes I have? Okay, five minutes. Okay, so switch gears and talk about how can we use these methods to perform optimization. So I want to go back to just doing maximum likelihood estimation. But you, you can use the same methods, these perturbed optimizers, to, to perform maximum likelihood estimation. Okay? So this is a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, let me try to go through this. So you, what we do is we start with the variational objective. And remember that there was a regularization term, and I'm just going to introduce a parameter tau. So if I set tau to zero, meaning I ignore this term, and I just do the same math. I write the mirror descent algorithm. I, you know, write the closed form, make the Hessian approximation. I get an algorithm that looks like Adograd. If you don't remember Adograd, it's okay. What happens here is that the scale vector is basically, you know, accumulating all these gradient magnitude. So the scale vector really grows quite a lot. And because the scale grows, the variance of the approximation shrinks. And your step size also starts getting sl smaller and smaller. So eventually you stop and your posterior collapses to, to a point. And when your posterior collapses to a point, you're basically just uh, converging to the local minimum of, uh, of the log likelihood. So this is natural evolution strategy. Uh, it's, it's, it's another method to do that. Um, then you can go a little bit uh, beyond this and you can sort of interpolate between where inference and optimization. So if you start with a tau that is equal to one, then it corresponds to variational inference. And if you slowly sort of taper it down to zero, then you start doing optimization. So this is one way to do optimization. In the beginning, if you have lots of local minimum, you might want to you know, perturb quite a bit so that you can avoid the local minimum. And then in the end, you sort of converge to, uh, to uh, hopefully a flatter local minimum. So to convince you about that, here's a small uh, result um, for avoiding local minimum. This example is taken from Casella and Robert's book. Um, and this is the objective function. The lots of local minimum, there's a flat minimum in the beginning. Uh, sorry, in the in the middle, uh, and if you use gradient descent, you can't really use stochastic gradient descent because this is uh, this is uh, not a stochastic objective. Um, so if you use gradient descent, you start at multiple position. You know these black dots are gradient descent. It basically just gets stuck there because it trusts the gradient too much, right? It's a greedy algorithm. Um, but if you do our method, which is basically in the beginning, it's doing variational inference, so it's Vadim. And then it goes to Vatagrade. I, I think I forgot to tell you that Adam version is called Vadim, Armis prop version called Vprop, and Adagrad version is called Vatagrad. So we are doing initially variational inference, which is Vadim, and then from there I'm coming to Vatagrad. If you do this algorithm, then it always uh, goes to the local minimum. So, you know, this is uh, quite promising for us, and we, we're trying to explore this further of where it actually makes uh, makes makes. Uh, a difference in deep learning, but this is related to a lot of fields in global optimization. So this method called optimization by smoothing, graduated optimization, Gaussian homotopy, and recently entropy SGLD that's been applied to neural networks. So this is kind of related to that. Yes. Yes. So it really depends on. W so if you're perturbing, if your variance for perturbation is not gone to zero, then you're doing optimization by smoothing. Meaning you're, when you perturb, you sort of smooth out your objective function. So you're not actually optimizing the actual objective function. It's a smooth version of it. But if the variance goes to zero, then eventually you will reach to a local minimum of the original objective function. So that only happens if you do add a grad. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's a little bit of detail. I could I could tell you offline about it. It's just basically whether I your scale vector, if it's a moving average, then it never uh, you know goes to infinity. If it's a running sum, then it goes to infinity. So your variance sort of shrinks if it's running sum. That's in Adagrad. Yeah, I mean Adagrad is designed specifically to work with sparse data. So uh, I, I think that's probably the reason because if you if you do this running sum when the data is very sparse, it doesn't have enough time to go to to grow that much. Maybe that's, that's hmm. 
Not yeah, I, I, I don't know how sparse it is. I've never thought about that. Yeah, but, so, yeah. Yeah. but let's, 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 talk, let's talk after the talk about that. Okay, any other questions? Am I supposed to finish by three, or can I take five minutes more? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, uh, so here's a large example on uh, on reinforcement learning. Um, I'm not a reinforcement learning expert, but I try to apply it to this. Uh, so this is actually about uh, parameter space exploration. There's the, this paper that um, you know, proposes this method. I I think uh, what you what you do basically is that you when you when you're running your reinforcement learning experiment, your episodes, you sort of take the parameter and you introduce some noise in your parameter. And when you introduce the noise, you you hope that that encourages some exploration uh, during your experiments. Right. So so this method uh, basically is SGD with no exploration. So there's no noise, no perturbation that has been injected. It sort of performs the worst. So higher is better. And if you do SGD and you learn the variance parameter using SGD, so how to perturb, is basically like the black box variational inference method. And this is uh, what these two papers, one from DeepMind and the other one from OpenAI, they're doing. And this is called noisy network for exploration. And this works, uh, but then it's, it's a little bit less stable, at least in our experiments. Um, uh, but if you do this natural gradient thing with our method, it sort of is more stable. That's what we found. Right? So we need to do more experiment to really say that this is, you know, a uh, um, stable result. Uh, but uh, here's some cool cheetah videos, you know. So with 5,000 reward, you sort of, the cheetah runs more smoothly. With 3,500, it sort of falls down every now and then. Okay. So, okay. So we also did some experiments on showing how it improves the marginal value of uh, uh, adaptive gradient methods. Uh, for time's sake, I think I should skip this. Uh, let me just, without just summarize uh, the whole thing. What I talked about is uh, is a method for doing natural gradient descent for variational inference, and I basically showed that it's possible to implement these uh, these methods just by introducing perturbation during back propagation uh, in your algorithm. Uh, the the method has some promising um, um, you know features that it enables us to blur the line between a variational inference and optimization. So hopefully, you know, in the future, these perturb optimizers that we are proposing, they can be used to avoid local minimum, to encourage exploration, and hopefully, in general, to improve existing deep learning optimizer. So uh, with, with this, let me give you a little bit of uh, future directions that we're doing. Uh, one thing that we have found is that this diagonal uh, covariance, uh, well, that's not a really nice thing because uh, your variance sort of shrinks whenever you use diagonal covariance. So we're trying to improve the uncertainty estimate by using a full Gaussian distribution. And now, if you look at the natural gradient update, because it's like a Newton method where you're scaling uh, the gradient by the covariance matrix, you can actually directly write it like a quasi-Newton method. So you can apply ideas from limited me memory methods to, to do this. Uh, and and this you could also write this to do some second order optimization for deep neural networks. So that's something that we are working on right now. The other thing that uh, that we we are looking at is uh, is trying to have more flexible search distribution. This is the Q Q of theta for uh, for natural evolution strategy. It turns out with mirror descent you can sort of write uh, you know in general for a mixture of exponential family you can uh, still write um, e easy to implement um, updates. One thing that I've been thinking about uh, is under what condition this type of perturbation always lead to, uh, lead to improvement over standard optimization algorithm. Uh, and I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of theory that needs to be worked out. And there's a lot of work in optimization literature and also computer vision on this. Uh, so I think it'll be really cool to see how it connects with all of that. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is straightforward to apply to, you know, other complex model for GP models or VAEs and spatial models, etc. Okay, so concluding my talk, the mirror descent connection is in this paper. This is from AI Stats. Uh, it's a method called conjugate co computation variational inference. Uh, the the connection to, you know, um, RMS prop and Newton method is discussed in this. A complete archive paper should be soon uh, out in two three weeks. Uh, and the code code will be out all as well in, in, in two, three weeks on, on my web page. Uh, the code will be available in TensorFlow, Torch, and Autograd, so I hope you will use it. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
We want coffee. <laughs> yeah. So um, if the parameter is a constraint, well, you, like variance is, um, you might work with in the log domain, but if you want to estimate covariance matrices or something, so a Gaussian approximation is not a good fit. Or like topic models, right? Um, so would you do just a, a, a reparameterization and then plug your stuff in? Does that affect yeah, so right now, it, this is very limited. You're right. I mean, it, uh, we've been able to figure it out for a scale mixture of Gaussian and also when you parameterize your mean parameter by doing some non-normalizing flow kind of thing. It would work there, but I don't know how to generalize this in general. So that's, uh, it's, I think Gaussian is very nice because then, you know, if you write the Newton method, then you have one-to-one -one correspondence between the parameter being the mean and the uh, Hessian being the covariance matrix. But if you do some other distribution, we don't know if it looks like the standard optimizer, right? So, any others? Cool. Um, I have a practical question. So I, I believe you that um, if you start with something like Baden, where uh, you introduce a lot of perturbations and you end up somewhere like Badagrad, uh, it should probably be a city somewhere. Uh, should probably be. Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, uh, then um, th that, that this is good, but like it seems like you need to get the schedule right, and it's problem dependent, and it's it's tricky and fiddly, and yet another thing to tune. Is that actually the case, or is that uh, like is there an easy way where I don't know who like? Uh, no, I think that's the case. So yeah, I don't know. So we, right now we are basically just having an annealing parameter and just you know let tau go from zero to one. We really don't know what should be the annealing rate for this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need this theory to really know if you want to make sure that this will always improve upon you know using other kind of optimizer, then we, we really need to build a theory for this. So, so so this is very beginning actually, just we're just starting to figure this thing out. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.